this will be, this is my sixth lecture uh, plus the introductory lecture and we're going to change things now because of the student schedules and stuff to do, do six lecture modules which in future years but now we're going to do we're starting now to make those six lecture modules and we're going to take the old modules and we're going to break them up from 12 to 6 okay and in any case so there's no class after today until next class next live class is Tuesday October 11th and that should be Dr. Belmar okay and then I think on the 12th I may just do a recitation okay so you can bring questions and ask questions and whatever um, so far as that goes but <clears throat> to finish up your 12 lecture modules if you I did lecture this stuff back in 2016 in the fall and if you do those four lectures 6, 7, 10, and 12, I looked at them briefly this morning. There's not going to be too much overlap. There will be new materials in there. And if you look at spring 2016, I did something called structural material selection where I didn't spend as much time on externalities and economics and things like that. If you look at 11 and 12, so that would be your next six lectures to complete this module for this semester. This semester is a little weird because you're on 12, 12 module, 12 lecture modules, and we're in this transition where we're going to go to six lecture modules, okay? And it doesn't really matter. You're not going to be quizzed on it anyway, so who cares? Okay. Um, the next lecture, because Dr. Belmar's out of town, I'm out of town some, some of my travel got changed, but it's just as easy to, uh, he'll, he'll finish up some things on the 11th, and maybe I'll do something on the 12th. We'll let you know about that. And then we're done with the live lectures. I told you we'd be done before Halloween and before it starts getting too dark out early in the morning. Um, even though we're not doing anything live for the next week and a half, I would encourage you to watch some of the modules, just as if it was being done live. Um, there are some modules, I don't know, understand why. A couple of times the thing was dark, okay? I gotta clean up some of these old things. Um, and so I, I did look at some of these this morning. I didn't watch the whole thing. Um, but uh, I think those, those six lectures will be, there's not a whole lot of redundancy, okay? I tried to, to cut it out. Any questions on that? Uh, hopefully you got your, and Brian's supposed to be checking on this. Uh, yesterday everybody's, you know, a little half page write up on what your topic's gonna be. I responded to people who sent them directly to me. Brian's going to check through them, uh, and we'll get that straightened out this this week. Um, and you can start writing your papers, which are due, I think, October 31st or something like that. Uh, the, the first draft has to be turned in, and then you have your little summaries to write up. I think a summary is due sometime around mid-October, but. If you watch these six modules, you'll be done with this module, and you may even be done with Dr. Belmar's module, okay? So you may be done with a couple of modules. Any questions on the assignments? Oh. So we were talking about um, uh, melting of, of metals, and specifically one of the problems, a serious problem, was how do you melt steel, which melts at 1,600 degrees centigrade, and you can't get but about a thousand degrees centigrade out of a normal fire burning in air. If you take hydrocarbons uh, and burn them in air, you're going to get 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 1,000 degrees C. And so you can, you can, with a little bit of help, you can melt cast iron. You certainly can melt copper alloys, but you can't melt steel. And the, before Henry Bessemer, the way they made steel, they would take cast iron, which is like four or five percent carbon, and they would blow air through it, and the carbon would burn off as carbon monoxide, and the, it would leave a lower carbon version of iron, and I told you that's wrought iron, which is malleable, can be forged, uh, as opposed to cast iron, which is not malleable. You try to forge it, and it'll crack, <laughs> okay? It's just brittle, uh, so far as that goes. And Henry Bessemer came along with his converter, 
which was a better way to blow oxygen through the iron. They called it puddling iron. If you want to learn about puddling, you can go look it up on Wikipedia. But guys would just stand there blowing a compressed air through a bath of steel. And it was a very slow process. Andrew Carnegie came along and he started, the railroads were being built around the world and he started making steel on a big, on a big way if you want to learn about how he got into this business. Uh, there was a couple of shady deals in Pittsburgh, okay, and he ended up owning a, a steel company, which is now U.S. Steel, uh, as it down through the last 150 years. And he became the richest man in the world in any modern history, even richer than, richer than Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or Carlos Slim or any of the guys today that are worth a lot of money in constant dollars. He was the richest. Um, and we talked about um, how Carnegie actually built what they called integrated steel mills, where you start out with coal and you'd have a coke oven where you put the coal into a rarefied atmosphere, just like we made charcoal. Basically, you didn't have a lot of oxygen. You burn off all the org organics out of the coal, and you end up with something that structurally has some structural integrity, basically a graphite, okay, which is called coke, okay. It's not, it's not the kind you drink. It's not the kind you shoot. It's, it's basically this black lump of stuff. And the coke ovens in Pittsburgh were one of the major reasons for the Air Quality Act of 1972, <laughs> okay. The coke ovens burning off all the organics in the coal just created a terrible atmosphere from a health, human health perspective. Was it just? Yep, just going off in the air, okay. Uh, and that's, that was acceptable back then. Back when I had worked for Bethlehem Steel, they had changed their, their iron ore charge from uh, something that was basically just sort of a rock that came out of what's called the Masabi Range in, in Minnesota. It was virtually pure iron ore, okay? It was just wonderful material, but we used it all during World War II and just after. And so they went to centered iron oxide, which they got from a bunch of rock in Minnesota, but they had to do some processing. And apparently, when they started putting the centered iron oxide in with the coke and the limestone in the blast furnace in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, they found they were producing 5,000 pounds a day of cyanide going up the stack. Okay? Didn't bother to tell anybody, because that would upset some people. Uh, but it didn't matter. Legally, they had no duty to clean up the air. <laughs> Just Okay, <clears throat> but they actually did fix it. They re realized it was something they should fix, and they figured out what the chemistry was that was <clears throat> giving them, um, and, and let's face it, cyanide is just carbon nitrogen, right? And so if you start burning carbon in air with nitrogen without a lot of oxygen, you can get a chemistry that gives you CN. So you've got cyanide. But uh, people living in Bethlehem just had to breathe the air, you know? That was the different rules they had back in the old days, okay? And because of some of those types of things, eventually Congress came up with the Air Quality Act of 1972, which is actually one of the beginning laws for the uh, Environmental Protection Agency and stuff, okay? So there, it's just like the, the labor unions. I mean, whether you're for pro-labor or, pro, pro -labor or not, if you go back and look at what the management was doing to the the uh, workers that were that were before unions back a hundred years ago. I mean, they were basically they'd hire Pinkerton guards when they had a problem, and these guys just you know fire at will, okay, and they would murder them, okay. There's a number of stories at Alcoa and U.S. Steel of Pinkerton come being hired to come in and shoot down the the, the rowdy labor force. They are all immigrants anyway, and you know. It, you know what the president thinks of immigrants, right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, again, it was sort of a different, a different standard, okay? And anyway, so integrated steel mills got to the point where they would consume tens of square miles, and they would cost about five billion dollars today. It'd be about twenty billion. I don't think I mentioned it the other day, but the last integrated steel mill to be built in the world by a private company was Bethlehem Steel Burns Harbor 
Indiana in 1964, finished about 19, about eight or 10 years later. Um, and it could produce 5 million tons per year, which was 5% of the US steel making capacity at the time. Um, and it had two blast furnaces, so if one of them went down, you didn't shut down the whole mill because it can take three months to reline a burst blast furnace. In fact, that's when, when I lived in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, boy, they relined the blast furnace, and that's when everybody got new grills for their, for their uh, patio, and I mean, everything, you know, everything went, it was a huge project, cost a couple hundred million dollars, and they were building all kinds of things in the shops, many of which actually went to the steel mill, but most of which went to the people's homes. <laughs> anyway. It was just extra stuff. Like yeah, extra stuff. It was, you know, they call it a government job, okay? Um, if you've ever heard that in some of these things, okay? Uh, there was, uh, without getting into it, there was, there was a lot of nepotism of, not necessarily family nepotism, but people scratching each other's backs when you got into management in the steel companies. They were, they were pretty corrupt, okay? Uh, in the 1930s, Bethlehem Steel had six of the top ten paid executives in the, in the United States worked for Bethlehem Steel. And Eugene Grace, who ran Bethlehem Steel during the 30s and the 40s, um, got paid a bonus on every ton produced, even though during the Depression Bethlehem was losing money. He got paid a bonus for every ton produced, whether they were making money or losing money. He made a fortune. And people just kind of accepted this as the way you know, what happened with management, okay? Um, and it's sort of the same type of thing. A lot of these companies like Bethlehem went bankrupt a few years later in the 80s. And it's just like I said, when, when General Motors went bankrupt and someone said, well, what do you think about General Motors bankruptcy? And I, my comment was, well, they earned it, okay? And the steel companies earned the bankruptcies they went through, okay? with a lot of arrogance and other things. Okay, so the blast furnaces we've talked about before. You got this big tall furnace, which might be 10 stories tall. Nowadays, you blow fuel in, you pour coal in the top. The fuel in here could be oil or natural gas, just to speed up the process. You have all your uh, coke, limestone, and iron ore, and those three components go in the top, and they work their way down. And every now and then, about once or twice a, a day, you tap the heat, uh, which means you drain off some of the liquid cast iron at the bottom of the blast furnace. You have to preheat the air, so you have these two big um, brick ovens, one of which is being preheated by the exhaust gas, and the other one is preheating the air that's going into the furnace and being blasted into the furnace. And about twice a day, you would switch over your ovens. so. The one that has cooled off now is going to get heated up, and the other one that's now hot from the exhaust gases will be preheating the air. And you just switch it over. We did the same thing with open hearths, which we don't have anymore in the world, but that's how Andrew Carnegie made his steel after the Bessemer converter in open hearths. So for about 100 years, we used open hearths, and you have this big brickwork lattice, same type of thing. In glass melting furnaces, we have the same thing. Instead of a bed of steel, you got a bed of glass. And in order to get the temperatures, you have to preheat the air coming in. You can't get more than 2,000 degrees with normal fuels, hydrocarbon fuels, whether it's natural gas or oil or coal or whatever. You're only going to get about 2,000 degrees. Take my welding course if, if you want to learn why. Okay, and then in the... Late 50s, early 60s, some Austrians decided, well, I can, I can go back to the puddling process. Instead of blowing in air, I could blow in pure oxygen because in Germany they developed the Lindy process for uh, uh, liquefying air and distilling it. And so they had lots of excess oxygen. They had lots of um, nitrogen, and they also had, you got 1% argon. Um, and you basically would distill the air into those three components and you had lots of liquid oxygen and um, you could blow that down through a water-cooled copper lance and essentially in this vessel that might be four or five stories tall, um, you basically, with just a five or ten feet of liquid cast iron in the bottom, 
you blow this in and in 20 minutes you can burn off all that carbon. And when it's gone, it's really exciting. Okay, but it's the same, same thing. You got a flux of limestone and sand and oxygen lance and um, but the volume inside here is about 20 or 30 times the volume of the steel and it foams up as a big froth. Okay. And sometimes people commit suicide by diving in. Uh, it's happened, happened when I was at Bethlehem Steel. You can tell because the body floats on steel is heavier than water, so you float right on top. And you see this charring mass in the shape of a person. Anyway. Why does an oxide form with the oxygen? Is it it's too hot? It's not stable? Or Why it doesn't oxygen? Because there's carbon. And the carbon burns to carbon monoxide, which is a reducing gas. If you keep blowing forever, after you've burned off all the carbon, you'll start burning off the iron <laughs> and form iron oxide. How do you tell? They know from experience how long you blow, how many, how many tons of liquid oxygen do you put into how many tons of cast iron. You knew how many tons of carbon you had. And experience, you can, they can get down. They don't blow below about 0.05% carbon in the steel because at that point you get to burning off iron oxide and now you're going back to where you started from and that's not very efficient, right? Now the person who worked all this out was a guy named John Chipman. If you go right across the hallway, you know, through the courtyard here, you hit the Chipman room. John Chipman was a physical chemist from Georgia Tech who came to MIT and he explained the physical chemistry of steel making for the world. Before that, it was almost, it wasn't quite empirical, but it was sort of an experience, alchemy. They didn't really know how to control it. But John Chipman in the 30s and 40s and 50s defined on the principles of physical chemistry, which he had learned on aqueous chemistry, you know, water-based chemistry. But he said, well, this should, these principles should apply at high temperatures. And he showed that they did. And John Chipman and then Tom King and and John Elliott after him, uh, which were two of his protégés, uh, and Tom King was the department head when I was a student, okay? But John Chipman, and I knew, I, I met John Chipman, he was retired, he'd retired in 62, I didn't start here until six years later, but, but I went to see John Chipman, he's a wonderful southern gentleman, uh, but he's, his name is, if you go to Japan or China, He's like a god, okay, because he explained steel making, this huge industry, and, and made it such that it's no longer this sort of alchemy uh, empiricism, as far as that goes. So from Andrew Carnegie's day until about 1970, they would take this steel and they would cast it into ingots, and these are the cast iron ingot molds on railroad cars, um, and there's the hot steel uh, that they're actually getting ready to pull. Actually, this is what they call a hot top. It's actually a ceramic thing and helps feed the liquid into the mold because the metal shrinks as it solidifies and you want to keep feeding liquid in uh, the top and it's obviously hotter at the top. You can see the glowing red here. And it takes about 20, it takes a, a day for this stuff to solidify, okay? You can't move these cars um, for at least 12 hours or so. Uh, once you pour it in. But then some people, again, I think it was Austria, um, decided they could try continuous casting. And continuous casting had been done on lower temperature metals like brass, uh, uh, brasses, copper alloys. And I told you they were doing it on gold alloys, which is not all that different than br brass. Uh, but in continuous casting, you have a ladle with molten metal that you melt somewhere else and you pour it into something called the tundish, which is just a bathtub holding things, and it drops the metal into a mold. The mold is water-cooled copper, um, and you will solidify a little skin on this, and this yellow band, that you actually have molten metal, and the whole thing is pliable, and so you have these rolls. This whole thing stands about seven stories tall. You have liquid metal in the center. If you get a breakout, it takes about a week to clean it up because you've got three or 400 tons of molten steel hitting the floor, okay, um, of this shop. The they do have a stopper in the tundish, but even there, you've still got this thing that can be 10 feet wide and 10 inches thick, and it's 50% liquid, <laughs> okay, on average. And so if that skin breaks, and they did break 
I mean, they, we'd have breakouts once a year or twice a year when I was in the 70s when I worked at the steel company. They almost never have it today because they got all kinds of process controls and infrared temperature sensors, and it's too expensive to have a breakout. Okay, when you're sitting there processing 5,000 tons of steel a day through here, you don't want to lose 25,000 tons of production over a week while you clean it up. And the whole cost of essentially rebuilding six stories worth of, it's, just, it's not a small job to fix this. But you do have breakouts, okay, um, from time to time. Not very many anymore. And in fact, the blast furnaces used to need to be relined about every six months. If you go back 400 years ago, they probably had to be relined every, every three or four months, which might be a season. Um, but now blast furnaces will go for three or four years before they have to be relined because they've improved the ceramics, the fire brick that's in there. Again, it costs too much. You know, it can cost several hundred million dollars to rebuild the blast furnace. It can cost a um, hundred million dollars or a couple hundred million dollars to rebuild all the worn parts in this uh, continuous caster. So I think the, the Japanese have it used to be the Japanese had the record for running continuous casters for a year or a year and a half at a time and making a continuous strand of steel that goes for about 150 miles. And they basically cut it off with a torch down here. What's the torch? Pure oxygen again. Don't need any fuel gas, the thing's very hot. Just come here and blow pure oxygen on something that's hot like that, cuts right through it. Like a knife, hot knife through butter. It's just a cold uh, oxygen knife through hot steel. Um, pretty pretty uh, exciting to see some of these things and also to see the size of these things. So you cut slabs and it says to go to storage. In fact, as we've increased productivity, we don't go to storage anymore and let this thing cool down. We actually go directly to the rolling mill, okay? And so we've had to reconfigure the, the steel plants and things like that. And the most efficient steel plants are the ones that, that uh, have a good layout so it, the process flows straight through, okay? Um, there's a process called argon oxygen decarburization. And it's the way we make all the stainless steel in the world today and most of the nickel-based super alloys for jet engines and stuff. Very high quality process. You, you think it looks like the BOF, the basic oxygen furnace, where you burn the carbon out of the steel. But in this case, you basically take the low carbon wrought iron type of steel and you blow um, oxygen and argon through there such that the oxygen is a lower pressure. You generate carbon monoxide at a lower pressure and you can get your carbon down below 0.03% you can get it down to 0.01% so far as that goes. And that means you can make very, very good quality stainless steel. This, the seeds of this were generated down in the basement of Building 8 with one of the graduate students of John Chipman. And he was just doing basic science on the chemistry of burning carbon out of steel. And he left MIT and he said, you know, we could make stainless steel this way by blowing argon through and now this is a AOD vessel. It has dropped the price of stainless steel by a factor of five to 10 in the world. And it's better quality stainless steel. It's cleaner stainless steel. It applies to nickel base alloys. It applies now a lot of your cast alloys, cast metals go through this AOD refining uh, situation. And it was basic research in the basement of building eight here that started it but it was first done um, when Krivsky left MIT and went to work for a very small little steel company that was willing to take a chance. The big steel companies who were big and bureaucratic, they wouldn't take any chances. Yep. Is this how you get all your low carbon? Yep. Like, lower than 0.5? Lower than 0.05. I mean, the, the carbon that, the lowest carbon you're going to get out of that BOF is 0.05% carbon. If you want to go low, you can go lower, but you're going to start losing iron right. as iron oxide, which is just wasted energy. If you want to go lower, you actually probably start at a tenth, okay? And then you blow, you do the AOD, 
and the AOD can get you down, if in some cases, to an order of magnitude lower in your carbon. For good weldability and corrosion resistance, you want to be below 0.03, and you can get six times lower than that, okay? At relatively little cost compared to the big cost. It also helps you with recovery of your chromium. That was why the, the price of stainless steel dropped so much. In order to get down to this low, when you throw the chromium in there, a lot of the chromium would go up into chromium oxide in the slag. And just like the problem of oxidizing the iron, you'd oxidize the chromium, which is fairly expensive. The nickel you throw in is an alloying element that has been made somewhere else by an electrolytic process at a nickel mill. But you made your stainless steel that way. And now we don't, we don't generate as, be, as much slag that has a bunch of chromium oxide and iron oxide. We basically control the carbon chemistry by controlling the the vapor pressure of the carbon monoxide by diluting it with argon. And if you really want to save money, you actually start out with a nitrogen oxygen mixture, but then you don't want the high nitrogen in most cases, so you switch over to argon oxygen. And that way you don't have to use that expensive argon. But in fact, steel mills are using so much liquid oxygen and liquid argon that they build. Lindy will come and build a a refrigeration plant to, to liquefy air right there next door and pipe it right over to your mill, but you know, through like six inch lines. I mean, it's a lot of liquid oxygen. The only people who use more liquid oxygen in a shorter period of time is the US Air Force sending rockets off, okay? But burning oxygen is a very, very violent, potentially violent. Anyone ever seen the Purdue uh, University charcoal uh, starting contest on YouTube. If you look up Purdue and you know charcoal starting, they used to have a contest to who could design the system. You know that would get your charcoal briquettes uh, burning fastest, and they basically had to stop it when one person decided to bring a 20-foot pole with a bottle of liquid oxygen and pour it on the uh, the thing, and and the carbon just goes. Poof! <laughs> it's all gone, <laughs> okay? I mean, pure oxygen burns things really quick. Plus, the fire department in West Lafayette wasn't really happy with, uh, with the safety of a bunch of people standing around this thing, okay? But you can see it on YouTube. Why is low carbon desirable for corrosion? In seals, in stainless steels, and actually, to a certain extent, in some nickel-based superalloys, you don't want a lot of carbon because what happens is I have a grain structure. I'm gonna just kind of draw the grains in here like this, okay, ideally, uh, in your metal. And if you have carbon, carbon diffuses faster than chromium. And if you heat up the stainless steels typically in the 800 to 1200 degree Fahrenheit range, which it turns out you will have that in the heat effect zone of a weld, okay? I mean, you can't get around it. If you're going to make a fusion weld somewhere in the heat effect zone, you're going to have that temperature. What happens is the carbon diffuses to the grain boundary. The chromium diffuses to the grain boundary, but from over a shorter distance because its diffusivity is about 100 times slower. So that little bit of carbon, if you're at 0.05 carbon with 18% chrome or whatever the amount of chrome is in your stainless steel, you will precipitate out chromium carbides, I'm going to call it X, X and Y, uh, it could be CR23, CR23C6, okay, I mean these carbides are really complex, or C3, uh, CR3C7, I mean there's a bunch of different carbides, but that means that a region of about two microns on either side of the grain boundary will be depleted in chromium. If you go and analyze that, you might find it only has 10% chromium in the depleted region because there's chromium everywhere, but the carbon has to diffuse from a larger distance, but it's a small atom and it does diffuse from a larger distance. And that del it, it denudes or makes the grain boundaries lower, uh, lower chromium and therefore not as corrosion resistant. In fact, John Wolfe, my academic grandfather, had a patent in the 1940s to what we call sensitized stainless steel, 
heat it in this region, get something like this, throw it in nitric acid overnight and make stainless steel powder. Because the nitric acid doesn't attack the 18% chrome, it does attack the 10% chrome, eats away the grain boundaries, and you get cracking, typical intergranular cracking along the grain boundaries. Cost General Electric a couple of billion dollars in the nuclear reactor industry in the 70s from the wells getting sensitization cracking. Okay. They need to use stainless corrosion. Yeah, they couldn't use. They could use. Well, if you were Westinghouse, you used Inconel's, as she said. You know, every what, wonderful, about ten times the price of stainless. But if you're building a pressurized water reactor, they needed because of the higher temperatures. They needed Inconel's. General Electric had a boiling water reactor. They could use stainless, less expensive material, uh, but more susceptible to what is called stress corrosion cracking, okay? And you get cracks through here in the reactor safe end, and you know that means that you're not gonna be able to f flood the reactor with water if you have a near meltdown, and you will not have a near meltdown, you'll have a real meltdown. So um, there's a lot of corrosion chemistry, obviously, to stainless steels, and a lot of it is controlling the carbon content, which goes back to the steel making process. And it's all because of AOD refining that has made all this uh, practical today. Okay? Any other questions on that? We also have, uh, well, oops, I thought I, okay. Whoop, what's going on here? Oh, okay. Um, so if I go to, this is a chart I put together uh, a few years ago. Back in the 1600s when they had Saugus Ironworks, it probably took about one person year per ton. The guy had to go chop the trees, make charcoal out of the, the logs. You basically stack up the logs, cover them with straw and mud, and then you light the inside, and, and there's not enough oxygen. So you burn off all the lignin in the logs, and you end up with not coke, we call it charcoal. But it's like today's coke made from coal. Okay, So that was your carbon for your blast furnace. You then had to go get the iron ore, dig it out of the ground. You had to get the limestone, digging it out of the ground. And when it's all manual work, it takes a lot of time. Okay, And then you got to run your blast furnace. So I estimated it probably was at least a person year per ton. They probably worked 60 hour weeks. These people were working long hours. Then Bessemer came, we probably dropped down and got bigger and more efficient over the next 200 years. And Bessemer came along and learned how to blow air into a converter. Carnegie came along and learned about, um, or invested in things like the basic open hearth. And things kept on marching along. But then after World War II, we had the basic oxygen furnace in the 50s and 60s. We had continuous casting in the 70s. Continuous casting went from having a yield of 65% to 97%. In terms of products, pounds poured versus pounds shipped, you went from 65% to over 95% because you didn't have to cut off the top third of every ingot, okay, because of the piping porosity and things like that. It gets more complex, but nonetheless, the continuous casting process was a big jump in productivity of saleable product. We used to have to produce 150 million tons of steel, pour 150 million tons of steel to make 100 million tons that we could sell in the United States. Um, mini mills, which we'll talk about in a second, and process technology, supposed to get cut off here. Um, and I mentioned, I think, that when I worked for a steel company in 1975, it was 50-50 labor raw materials. Back here, it was labor intensive. Today, it's like 90% raw materials, okay? Because we've taken all the labor out, okay? Here's the labor on a log scale, and we're down to less than 20 minutes a ton, person hour per ton, to produce steel. As Gordon Forward, a uh, graduate of this department who started a mini mill, and we're gonna talk about the mini mills in a second, uh, said if the, if the Koreans, 
or the Japanese want to sell steel in the United States, all he has to do is produce it within $30 of their cost. Because the, the cost of the raw materials, coke, limestone, and iron ore, they're transported, they're, they're a commodity around the world, okay? Everybody's paying the same price, pretty much. Uh, but it costs $30 a ton to ship a ton of steel across the Pacific Ocean. So Gordon Ford said, if I can make it for only $30 a ton more than they make it in their big fancy integrated mills, I could build a smaller mill and I can beat the price, and he did. And we'll talk about that. But basically, in all of this, the whole story of steel over the last 50 years is um, there's a book that MIT put together in the, in the 80s. We started writing it, uh, where the beginning sentence is, to live well, a nation must produce well. And Paul Krugman, who was a faculty member at the Sloan School, then he went to Stanford, where he won the Nobel Prize in economics, he says, productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it's nearly everything, okay? If you want to talk about quality of life, maybe not over a one-year period, but if you want to talk over today, a 10 or 20-year period, productivity is everything, okay? In the old days, it might be productivity growth over 100 years, okay? But today, it's, it's over much shorter time constants. So, um, Here's a little cartoon. All 19 layers of management agree that uh, we have to cut some of the, the fir first line employees if we're to stay competitive, okay? So I'll ask you this question, which I asked at the National Institute of Standards and Technology when I was on their visiting committee about 10 years ago and I got kicked off for asking the question and other things. What's the difference between productivity and competitiveness? They didn't know, by the way, so if you don't know, it's okay. And the, this is the national laboratory that's responsible for productivity. And what they did is they got up and said, we're the national, NIST is the national laboratory for competitiveness. And I, as this guy gives this introductory talk, at the end I said, well, you mean you're the national laboratory for productivity, right? No, no, we're for competitiveness. I said, do you know the difference? And the answer is he didn't, well, yes. Well, for an economist, productivity is how many hours per ton it takes to make steel or per, to make a computer, okay, or to make anything. It's, it's the labor productivity. Competitiveness, on the other hand, has to do with exchange rates and regulations and trade, you know, restrictions. All these things that Congress sort of controls or the economy controls that have nothing to do with technology. You can talk about it as externalities to pro productivity. You know, I talked about technology and I said there's all these externalities that affect the technical decisions we make. Well, competitiveness is sort of the same thing on an economic scale to productivity. Productivity is how efficiently can I manufacture something? Productivity or competitiveness is what's the selling price on a global economy. And, you know, that's why people fight about whether the, the Chinese uh, dollar is, or Chinese um, renminbi, yuan, yuan. They have renminbi in China and they have yuan externally. Okay, they have di different currencies, okay, different pieces of paper um, because they don't want their people there are people being able to do international. It's, it's all. Anyway, they have great control over the, the exchange rates. And if they have artificially low exchange rates, then they can be very competitive, even though we may be more productive. The Japanese are more productive at producing a ton of steel than the Chinese. But they have lower labor rates in China. But labor is not the big thing. What it is, is they're going to keep making steel. They will dump it on the world market. If we have a, a, a steel glut, and one of the things is, we do have a steel glut of overcapacity in the world. When you have a productivity that has gone like that, okay, what happens to your, your manufacturing capacity? You've got excess manufacturing capacity. 
Over the decade of the 1980s, when everybody thought the U.S. steel industry was hitting the, the, the toilet, well, that's what Wall Street thought, but they were doubling their productivity. I've got the data that shows we were consuming 100 million tons of steel each year in the United States. The workforce went from half a million employees to 250,000 employees. What does that say about the productivity? The productivity doubled. It went up by four or five percent in ten, a year for 10 years. And the only industry that had a higher productivity growth rate in the United States was the mining industry, which has an even lower self-esteem on Wall Street, right? What was the office productivity? All the great, you know, IBMs and, you know, Goldman Sachs and everybody. It went down by 1% over 10 years, okay? Because they, they got computers and they didn't know how to use them. I mean, initially, computers actually killed productivity, okay? They're actually now sort of getting past that after 25 years. But nonetheless, some of the most productive industries were mining and steel. And so if we look back at this thing, to live well, you must produce well, but everybody thought steel was crap. As an investment, it was, because they had a worldwide overcapacity. And it turns out steel mills would go bankrupt. They would sell their assets. Some third world, world nation would buy it. And the next thing you know, they're taking the old equipment with their low labor and maybe their cheap iron ore or ready access to coal, good metal quality coal, and they're, they're competing with old ancient equipment that they bought for 10 cents on the dollar, and you haven't gotten rid of it. So after about 10 or 15 years of this, the steel companies realize they basically would just scrap their old plants rather than see them show up competing with them again. But these types of lessons we have to learn over and over again. One of the great industries in the United States, or in New England back 125 years ago, was the shoe industry. Okay, This is where they made shoes. I remember as a young assistant professor going to this basement warehouse in Boston in this old, old building that had probably been built 200 years before, and they had all kinds of shoemaking machines. And they were refurbishing them from these old mill buildings in New England, and they were selling them in South America, okay? Well, in a lot of ways, they should have, rather than selling the old equipment, they should have melted it down because those shoes ended up coming back, being made by lower cost labor in South America, okay? Same thing happened in the steel mills, and it took the management a little time to realize selling your old equipment to someone who has an economic advantage of low labor costs just means that you have worse competition that you have to face. But because of these productivity gains um, that I showed you in the, that slide, they had, they had like 30, 40% overcapacity. I mean, the United States was only using 100 million tons of steel in the 1980, 1990, but the workforce went down by a factor or two. Wall Street and the labor union says, oh, this companies, these, these companies are dying. They were because no one would invest in them because they had too much overcapacity. They had, it took them until the 1990s to get rid of some of that overcapacity. In the meantime, this guy in India named Mittal, M-I-T-T-A-L, started buying up old steel plants around the world. And now, you might know, what happened to Mittal? They buy a German. Yeah. Well, they're talking about merging with Nissan Krupp right now. Yeah. Okay. To become, they are the large Arcelor Mittal. Arcelor was the French steel company, which at one time I think merged with they're British Luxembourg. steel. Arcelor Mittal is in. It was based in Luxembourg. Yeah. Mittal is this Indian who realized a steel is a big industry, and the world needs steels steel and people are selling um, the Wall Street bankers they're so smart they're selling all the equipment for 10 cents on the dollar or less and he decided to start buying it and wait for the overcapacity to work its way out of the system and now he's a multi-billionaire okay and also our Mattel is the largest steel maker in Europe 
if they merge with Nissan Krupp, they will become the second largest steel company in the world after Bao Steel, which is the Chinese steel company that just produces steel. Turns out, since 1964, when Bethlehem Steel started to build Burns Harbor, no private company has invested in a new integrated steel mill. Bethlehem Steel was the last company in the world to do it. Cost them $5 billion, they almost went bankrupt, but by 1974, they had the most profitable year they ever had because they had a new, fancy, modern, high productivity steel mill as opposed to these 1910 versions they were working with. And uh, Burns Harbor is still one of the most, probably the most efficient plant in the United States. And it's grown and people have continued to invest in it while closing other mills. Okay, um, but in the meantime, Mittal, understanding the economics and the need and the overcapacity, basically became a very rich person. Um, the only there have been plenty of steel plants built in the world since 1964, but they've all been built by countries. You take the Koreans. When I was in the 1990s, I was the POSCO professor. Okay. POSCO was the Korean Steel Company. It turns out the, the president of Korea took one of his colonels and said, Mr. Park, I want you to go and start a steel company. And so Park went and talked to U.S. Steel. U.S. Steel sold him the technology, and they built POSCO Steel in, in Korea, which by 1997 was the world's largest steel company from 19, the early 1970s, in 25 years, they became the largest steel company in the world until the Chinese passed them by a long shot. But um, that was at the backing of the government of Korea to build, a, what was that time, probably a 10 or $15 billion plant. And they built a couple of them, okay, in Korea. But Korea doesn't need but a couple of them. Saudi Arabia's got lots of natural gas. So what do they do with their natural gas? They build a gas reduction facility. They don't use blast furnaces. They, are, they use all the natural gas that they can't get out of the country any other economical way. They import iron ore and they make steel because steel is fundamental to a growing economy. That's what the Japanese did after World War II. They built steel companies and then they built shipyards they became the largest shipbuilder in the world. Other people have passed them by, but people are all using that model. The road to industrialization is first make steel, then start making ships if you're close to the ocean. And then you, know, you start making automobiles and other things. Okay? That's what the Koreans did, but they did it after the Japanese. You didn't start seeing Hyundais on the road until after you saw Toyotas on the road. right? Koreans are just copying the Japanese. And the Americans are all sitting there like deers in the headlight. Okay? Watching all this happen and denying that there was anything to it. I remember the month that I left Bethlehem Steel, Edgar Speer, who is the president of U.S. Steel, he was also president of the American Iron and Steel Institute, which is a collection of all the companies. He was on Iron, the front page of Iron, Ma Iron Age magazine, and in the article it, he said, the Japanese are not using anything we don't know about. What an idiot, okay? They were using it, the best technology in the world, and we knew about it. That's sort of like General Motors, you know? Toyota wasn't using anything that General Motors didn't know about, okay? General Motors has the best technology in the world for making automobiles. It's right there in the research laboratory. It's not on the road. It's right there on the research laboratory. They spend billions of dollars. In the 1980s, you could have purchased Toyota on the Tokyo Stock Exchange, if the law would allow you, for less than the uh, production equipment budget of General Motors for that decade. General Motors invested $50 billion in new plants and equipment, decided their employees were dirt, worse than dirt, and they, they had a, practically a bounty to put in a robot to get rid of a person, okay? 
In the meantime, what were the Japanese doing? They were developing the Toyota production system and treating people like they were empowered to make decisions like intelligent human beings. In, in Detroit, we treated people like dirt. They weren't allowed to make any decisions. If they thought something was going wrong, shut up, I'm the management, do as I say. Okay? So when General Motors went bankrupt, I said, they earned it. And they did. Okay? So that's enough for today. Uh, actually, it's enough for until the 11th and 12th. Okay? If you have some questions, it turns out a couple of my trips got canceled. So I will be around some in the next couple of weeks, but I'm gone the next two days.